Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to be here, and thank you, everybody, who uh, came. These are my disclosures. I don't believe that any of them are relevant to this subject matter. So when I do this talk, I want to talk about this from the 30,000-foot view at first in this context of value-based care, which is a buzzword we've heard a lot about in the past few years. And when you think about value-based care, you really kind of think about it in two ways. One is in the context of the patient, where you want to provide the most appropriate, effective, and enduring care. And the other is in the context of the provider, where you really want to be providing evidence-based treatment options, which are patient-centered and aligned with patient goals. So really, what becomes the issue of these clinical pathways and, and different things that we're talking about, and a lot of this has to do with addressing the variability in clinical practice. Variability that we know from the literature promotes inequity, impacts patient outcomes typically negatively, and impacts healthcare costs. And we know that reducing variation can lead to improved care. But the clinical care pathway definition is a little bit disparate. It's, we think of this as a task-oriented care plan about the expected clinical course that a patient should undergo. And the goals of these pathways are really care standardization, outcomes improvement, and cost reduction. But there's been a very mixed reception to clinical pathways, and a lot of this has to do with how these pathways were rolled out. In 2003, there was nearly 80% nearly of hospitals in the United States had a pathway of some sort, but there was no designed implementation intervention that went with these pathways. So you have an enormous resource commitment from the hospitals, an enormous burden on the stakeholders, but no real way to know if these pathways are, are making a difference. And one was not surprised then that individual studies about the benefits of such pathways are varied and contradictory. Additionally, there's no standardized definition. And even in this talk, sort of on purpose, you'll hear me at some times talk about a clinical care path, a pathway, and it's because there's over 84 different terms used that could potentially mean a clinical pathway within the literature. Nonetheless, we accept these clinical pathways in bariatric surgery. In fact, they're part of our accreditation for MBS Equip. So anybody, everybody here MBS Equip accredited? Nice COE centers, proud show of hands. Right, so you all and everybody have a clinical pathway associated with their bariatric program? Everybody know what's in that clinical pathway? Not, not as many hands. And, and really, it's because there is a lot of variability out there. So what are the data in bariatric surgery around these pathways? Well, in 2008, there was a retrospective series that looked at 45 patients following implementation of a clinical care path. And this pathway was really centered on perioperative variables. And what they found was there was about a 71% compliance rate after the clinical pathway was implemented, a decreased length of stay, and decreased cost to the hospital. And from this study, it was concluded that implementation of a pathway within this specific system reduced variability in practice and hospital cost. In 2012, another retrospective series was published. This series assessed 64 patients prior to the implementation of pathways as compared to 64 patients after. And again, what they saw in this was significant improvement in some of those perioperative metrics, timely remover of Foley catheters, patient mobilization, increased use of spirometers in the perioperative period, increased oral supplemental nutrition, and shorter lengths of stay. They did not, however, demonstrate any difference in the mortality, morbidity, reoperations, or readmissions within these patients. In 2014, however, another retrospective analysis of prospectively uh, collected data was performed, and this followed 229 patients. And interestingly, they saw in this latter series that there was improvements in their length of stay, in 30-day readmission rates, 30-day morbidity rates, and 30-day mortality rates. Interestingly, they also saw that the mean prospective cost savings was about $2,000 for the ruin y gastric bypass and $1,200 from the sleep. So from this study, they concluded that there was decreased both in complications as well as costs. And this has been corroborated by other small single institution studies that show cost reductions, reduced length of day, and decreased rates of complications. So if we all kind of agree that we see an emerging trend towards utility and benefit in these pathways, and it is a requirement of MBS AQIP to be accredited, we figure that the pathways should be agreed upon, right? 
So we went to study this because we really didn't understand what the quality and content of these variable pathways in different programs were. So in 2014, under the leadership of Dan Jones, when he was running the Quality and Patient Safety Committee at ASMBS, we sought out to answer this question and figure out what are people doing in practice? How do these pathways look? Are they similar? Are they different? What do they detail? And so what we did was solicit clinical pathways from who we thought the real stakeholders would be. So people who we thought if they were going to have a robust clinical pathway would be this group of people. So we solicited pathways from the executive council, from uh, the quality and patient safety committee members and state chapter uh, presidents. And pathways were analyzed based on metrics pertaining to preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care. And then we looked for concordance and discordance. And here you can see some of the variables collected. And they essentially centered on the workup of patients, what were being done, how patients were being managed in the operating room. And then what were we doing for them in the immediate uh, perioperative period. In total, 31 pathways were collected. The number of pathways that were collected per program ranged from one to 10 with a median of three. I can tell you some programs sent me a flow chart and other programs sent um, eight dissertation type pathways. So there was a lot of variability even in how the pathways were presented. And there was a ton of discordance, nothing agreed. Out of all those metrics, really only six metrics had a concordance greater than 65%. This was the preoperative nutritional evaluation, preoperative psychologic evaluation, VTE prophylaxis, anti-emetic utilization, pain pathway, and guides to post-operative laboratory studies. And this doesn't mean there was robust information about any one of these metrics, it just meant that it was mentioned. So in conclusion, we saw that there was really national variation in the care pathways around centered on the care of our bariatric patients. And, what was, and we understand that while what's written may not represent actual practice, it is what we had to work with. And from this sprung this next idea of can we develop a standardized care map for our patients undergoing bariatric surgery. And this was really a, a quality improvement initiative as well as a mandate from MBS AQIP. So we sought to do that, and under the um, uh, presidency of Raul Rosenthal, they formed a task force within the QUIPS committee, which was composed of all these people, where we went to develop a care path around sleeve gastrectomy. And this really was a monstrous undertaking, which really went to streamline care for patients who are undergoing a primary sleeve gastrectomy with a metrics plan uh, to determine its efficacy and uh, adherence. And what we did for this was a massive literature search. I can tell you that there was almost a thousand documents which were initially looked at and then whittled down for review. Each was graded for evidence and based on the strength of that evidence, a recommendation was made. And we looked at this, again, from the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative lens. And again, these recommendations were essentially recommended, things that should be done in almost all patients, things that are selective, and things that are not routine or shouldn't be done. And before I move forward with some of these recommendations, I don't want to make everybody super excited that we came to a conclusion. What we did find is that we're really living in the yellow a lot in bariatric surgery, and that we have a lot of gaps where we do have a lot of evidence that's missing to be able to make best practice recommendations around our patients. So I'm not going to go into all of this, as this paper was actually accepted, the pathway was approved, and um, I actually just got the proof, so hopefully we'll be out in publication within the next few weeks at least in the electronic form. But you can see in the preoperative pathway, things that we could agree upon, things that there was robust evidence on, really centered around laboratory values, different screening, not that we have to do the screening, but ask about the screening and ensure the patients go through this. What really is in the selective category is kind of all those high ticket items, right? The things that are costly, the things that are expensive, what do we do? Do we test for H. pylori? Do we do upper GI series? Should we be doing standard preoperative endoscopy? And there was so much conflicting data on this that we really weren't able to make any definitive recommendations. But not routine, much shorter list, helpful, but mandatory preoperative weight loss. That doesn't mean your practice can't encourage weight loss, but mandating that routine IVC filter placement, and um, routine bowel prep were things from the literature that we could make recommendations that this would not be performed routinely. How about intraoperatively? Again, VTE prophylaxis. We all agree it should happen. The chemo prophylaxis part of it, a little bit nebulous still. Um, antibiotics, patient positioning guidelines, 
Uh, this was a little controversial, but it eventually settled on a bougie greater than or equal to 34 French. And um, hiatal inspection were all things people agreed upon. But again, if you look at the, the selective or what we didn't really know to make a recommendation one way or another, buttressing and oversewing the staple line, that's no surprise there. I think there's been so much conflicting data that have come out around there. And again, identifies a practice gap which we need to fill with more information. Uh, not routine, routine use of drains. We felt comfortable that there was enough evidence to suggest you don't need to routinely use nasogastric tubes, closed suction drains, or urinary catheters for routine patients. We are not concerned. As well as routine invasive monitoring, such as venal, central venous access or arterial line in your basic patient. And finally, post-operative sleeve gastrectomy. Again, prophylaxis, something we think all our patients need. We're not there yet with the specificity, but we do think that this is very important. Diet, post-operative visits, post-operative medications, early ambulations, and length of stay, as well as monitoring. Selective, again, some of the monitoring, medications, consultations that should occur in this period. And not routine is the continuation of antibiotics in the perioperative period, routine use of post-operative day number one, upper GI series, and routine admissions, the intensive care unit, which was going on at some institutions. So in the end, whether or not you like them, hate them, or how you feel about them, care pathways are an essential requirement to accreditation. And we do see clear national variability in the care plans that we have around our patients. Um, I do think, and I think the data support, that care pathways in bariatric surgery do have value to patient outcomes and potential cost reductions as well as streamlining care. Uh, this care pathway for sleeve gastrectomy will be available soon in the next couple of weeks in electronic form. But I think the one thing this really did was identify those practice gaps and identify those areas where we really need more data so we can push things more into that green or red area and truly provide streamlined, comprehensive care for our patients. And again, this is not something that's meant to be static. This is a continual development. It's a continuous quality improvement project which will change and update and morph as we get more data. So thank you very much for your attention.